It's Wednesday night for those of you listening to the audio Thursday or beyond, and you are tuned into the finest in paranormal news reporting. This is the Paranormal 60 News. I am your anchor, Dave Schrader, and tonight, the ghosts of the Titanic edition. Plus, we're going to talk about an exciting new development in AI and interfacing that may allow you to control your dreams. Are you ready for that, America? How about the rest of you, world? And a TikToker is suffering paranormal phenomena after playing the Ouija board for five days. And we're going to talk about a, a U.S. soldier who spent time aboard a UFO describing the privilege of 92 days living with aliens. All that and more right here on the very best in paranormal programming. I'm Dave Schrader, and this is the Paranormal 60 News. Good evening, my darklings. Thank you so much for tuning in to the very best in paranormal programming. Tonight, we are a little thin to win. It is down to just the two last paranormal news anchors willing to bring you the news worth hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, Chachi. Hey, Chach. I'm here, Dave. You know me. I don't miss it. I know. Nobody else could be bothered because, well, here's a little secret. This is live on tape. We have pre-recorded Tuesday night to make sure you all had a brand new episode to watch live Wednesday and the rest of you could hear Thursday morning like it always comes out. So thank you, whoever you are, wherever you are for tuning in. And uh, I am off on a cruise again. This one, hopefully I get to get on. So I'm very excited going with my uh, family and hoping to have just a nice relaxing time. I'll be back Monday and I want to just get you a little excited here, but it's time to do a little bit more Black Eyed Kids stories. Gemma Jade returns, and we're going to go into more cases of Black Eyed Kids. That's on Monday night. Let's get to the news and talk about what's going on in the world around us. You know, Chach, coming up very soon, April 12th, I think, if I could be wrong, my math is off a little bit usually, it's like the 375th anniversary of the sinking of Titanic. I, I think you might be off a couple digits. I, I don't know much about the Titanic. I know that Rose let the poor guy go, but other than that, my, my history is very limited. Worst girlfriend ever <laughs> that you just met on a ship. I understand. Uh, now that I think about it, really, she did us all a favor. Um, no, the Titanic obviously has captured the attention of the world. Anything Titanic does well. The movie came out and was amazing. Titanic 2... I don't think that did as well, uh, so I shouldn't say anything with the name Titanic on it. Uh, Titanic 2, T-O-O, -O, I think was another movie that came out and was ridiculous. But there are, yeah, yeah, it was uh, like a schlocky horror movie, I believe. Okay. So uh, Titanic's been really popular. So popular, I actually had a 1967 sealed edition of the Titanic board game. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought, oh, it was in our closet. I you know I guess I inherited it from my grandparents or something. I took the lid off. Everything was still sealed. So I drop it on the old eBay of pigs, and I think it went for close to $200. You're kidding. No, people love real Titanic stuff and the real Titanic. Say, I'm not sure if that qualifies. My grandparents might have bought it while riding the Titanic. I'm not sure because I don't remember all the years. Numbers are hard, Chachi, very I, hard. You get me. it. You know what? If only, if only there was an expert we could bring on that could talk to us. Oh, I bet there is. You think so? I think so. All right, you're probably right, ladies and gentlemen. Joining us right now, William Brower. He's an author who's written about Titanic, and in two weeks he has a live presentation. He's going to be talking about the haunting of Titanic and more. William, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Well, good good evening, uh, David Chachi. Thank you so much for having me. I mean. You know, long time fan and you know, happy to be here. 
I oh. think what I like best and, about this uh, visit with you is the 1980s music video effect to your screen. For those of you just listening, not watching, uh, William's got kind of the green draped wall behind him, and it, we're getting like the AOL dial-up choppiness of this. His audio is coming through, so hopefully we'll be able to continue on with this uh, full uh, miniature interview that we wanted to do. But you're, you're rocking the 1980s vibe for uh, AOL dial-up and Max Hedrum. William, the Titanic, how long has it been since it sank? It's actually going to be uh, 112 years uh, this coming April 14th. That and, was pretty uh, close. 15. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I definitely probably will not ask you to help me with my taxes this year, Dave, but. Oh, Dave know. and taxes. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're guaranteed a refund. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, William, is it true that it was built on April 12th or it completed built on April 12th and then ended up sinking on an April 12th? Did I read that correctly? Um. So not quite. Um, actually, it uh, she was complete um, and launched on May thirty first, nineteen eleven. Okay. And then, yeah, the maiden voyage started on the tenth, and then um, twenty of midnight on the fourteenth, uh, she struck an iceberg, and then two twenty a.m. on the fifteenth is when she went under. Now, I've I've been told on pretty good authority that it was actually a kraken that bit the side of the Titanic and dragged it down. Uh, some say iceberg. I mean, if you want to buy into the Hollywood schmutz, what do you make of it being really a giant undersea creature that did the Titanic in? Well, I mean, I've, I've heard kraken. I've even heard UFO death ray. Um, you know, oh. so you, we have, we have lots of options, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, we know it's iceberg. <laughs> Now, there's been a lot of strange conspiracies where it comes to Titanic. Um, but it, am I right on this? Because, again, this is another one. I wanted to talk to the guy that's the expert on this. Uh, I guess there was a book that had come out years before Titanic um, that talked about this famous pleasure cruiser. And I think they called it the Titan in the book. And mm -hmm. it goes on to strike an iceberg and sinks. And it mirrors the story of what actually happened to Titanic down to just about every detail. Is that true? It is to a degree. I mean, there, there's enough of it on the fictional side that uh, doesn't fully align, but, you know, the physical description of the ship and everything else, uh, for the most part, is a yes. But uh, to really add on to that story, which is where, if you really want to go for a case of irony, because of the fact that that was a popular title, that was actually on the ship's library. <laughs> so, oh wow foreshadowing yeah yeah oh wow so i mean but it was pretty close to just about the way that it really sunk right i mean she was pretty pretty detailed and i believe was it a female author that wrote the book uh, no it was actually a, a gentleman by the name of morgan robertson and you know just one of those cases uh it was uh you know, just kind of doing the old uh, nickel and penny uh, magazines, just writing random uh, stories. And, you know, this particular one came out 14 years before the sinking itself. So that's one of the reasons why so many people uh, still look at it and think about it to this day. <laughs> now, I, I believe one of the other strange conspiracies surrounding it is that there are people that believe that it wasn't the Titanic that sunk, but her sister ship, the, was it the Lusitania? Is that correct? Um, Olympic. Olympic, that's right. Sorry. I just want to stop the yeah. show for a moment here, Dave. Yeah. I'm so far, I've been off on all of the Everything wrong you brought up. And that is so <laughs> unlike you. I am so glad Williams here. I told you I'm not much of a Titanic guy, but I love the concept. Uh, you've got these ideas. <laughs> well, that, right? that, oh, but believe me, I, you know, I, I've heard of them. I've heard all for all of them over the years. So no worries, Chachi. But uh, yeah. <laughs> The easiest way I can tell you that um, you know, nine times out of ten, everybody within the community helps to debunk that is that uh, have you ever built uh, model cars? Uh, in, you know, when you were younger and stuff, no. any model cars, model airplanes? No, I just I got so high on the glue I could never complete any of it. So if I'm being if no I'm being worries. Honest. Well, <laughs> for all intents purposes, um, right. Titanic and uh, Olympic had uh, serial numbers, so you okay. can actually just match everything 
that way. And then, you know, there you go. There's what you got. <laughs> well, where do these weird conspiracies come from, William, that people believe that it was a completely another, a completely different ship that sank in Titanic's place? Well, for that one, that came from a gentleman by the name of Robin Gardner, who wrote a book about it, uh, just to kind of capitalize on the uh, Titanic fever of uh, James Cameron's film. Not familiar. And I mean, it's it, it's one of those things, uh, you know, the, the, right. the book is a dry read to begin with. Um, I know I have, a, I still have about a half a dozen copies sitting over on my desk because everybody likes to send me stuff. Titanic sure. related in case I don't have it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a dry the, the book that talks about it being the Olympic, not the Titanic. You said that's a pretty dry read. It is, yeah. Have you ever thought of throwing it at like an iceberg to see if it gets a little more moist that way? I I've, I've been tempted to, but I I I'll put it to you this way. You know, there's a problem when even the goodwill looks at it and says, "Oh, I'm sorry, we don't, we're, we're not going to take this." <laughs> goodwill refuses the book. They're like, "No, no, you can't give that away." Yeah, um, people are just listening, going, "Dave's a moron." Uh, now you know why I allow myself to be surrounded by good anchors because when it comes to these things, I really know very little. I don't. I mean, it's way past my. Uh, my my birth date you know it happened long before i was around and i really only know what i know from the uh the movie and you know some oh, yeah. of the other uh you know things that have popped up from here and there but there's been so many um different conspiracies that seem to have popped up since the james cameron film and making people try to re-examine these concepts but let's get into the haunted aspect. You know, I, I visit Vegas every year. Chachi and I would go for Super Bowl. And they had mm -hmm. a Titanic exhibit. And I, I want to say, where was it? Was it at the uh, Luxor, Chachi? Do you remember? Yep. But no. I'm no. right. Yes, you got it. You got it right Blind there. Squirrel. Wow. Blind squirrel. Blind squirrel a, a bl in a broken clock. We get things right once in a blue moon. So. Uh, yeah, I, I actually went over and I talked to one of the employees one day uh, because I was working behind the scenes for Ghost Adventures, and we were trying to access the exhibit because we heard there were ghost stories, and I wanted to know if they really had things happening. And uh, the the guy at Luxor, he I remember he's like, let me uh, let me get my manager out here. And this woman came out, and he goes, yeah, this guy wants to know about the ghost stories, and if there's any. And she goes, officially, no, there's no ghost stories. And then she started nodding. And she looked at her mm -hmm. at the guy, and he's and he starts nodding. And I go, "Oh, so officially, no ghosts at this exhibit. Unofficially, it could just be the ghosts from the Luxor." And they're like, "Theoretically, but uh, but I guess they've had a lot of strange experiences at these exhibits. What can you tell us about that?" Well, I mean, you know, just like uh, with any other haunted uh, location. It's it's whether or not it's a scene of great tragedy, which in this case it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for sure, without a doubt, you know, there's there's a lot of areas uh, to, you know, that are tied to the ship that do have a lot of the residuals. Um, mm -hmm. Probably one of my personal favorites, and this actually came from my uh, you know, one of the passengers who survived, and her name was uh, Margaret Brown. Um, Hollywood knows her as the unsinkable Molly Brown inside. Oh, okay. And her, you know, her house is still standing as a historic museum up in uh, Denver. Yeah, and it's and haunted. It, very much so. Yes. Right. No. Yeah. Look at that. And, I'm two uh, for two, and no one saw. I'm making notes here. That you're, yeah. If, if I get her to the first <laughs> yeah, ten well, minutes of the show, you're batting a thousand, Dave. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. If we, if we can get up, get it up to an even four, I'll send. Oh, I'll, I'll send you a bottle of beer. <laughs> wow, oh, I'm in. The book you have. I know just the book. <laughs> Just no, he's going to send me the one about the Olympic being replacing the Titanic. I don't want it. Goodwill doesn't want it. I don't want it. So go ahead now. Uh, yeah. So the unsinkable Molly Brown. What do we know about the ghosts associated with that story in the Titanic? Well, for for the most part, it's actually um, you know, some of her other family members. But uh, probably my personal favorite ghost story and haunting about it. Um, was the fact that there was a uh, woman that decided to go by the museum one day, and she ended up taking a tour, and her tour guide was an elderly lady in a period dress, and walked her through and gave the whole 
spiel and everything else, but then also explained that, um, you know, at, at the end of the tour, she would not be able to go and buy anything in the gift shop because the gift shop was closed. So, needless to say, she uh, ended up calling the museum the next day to compliment the uh, tour guide. And, you know, the uh, docent at the time explained that uh, they don't have anybody dressed in period clothing. <laughs> and the museum was actually closed on Monday to begin with. <laughs> so, oh, wow. That's a twist. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you liken that to, William? Now, is it a ghost of Titanic or could it have been a time slip? From 20 years from now, when when they decide, you know, let's be more kitschy and dress in period costume and let people come in and we'll take them through the tour as we're dressed like the the survivors. What do you think about the possibility that it really was an employee, but just one that isn't there now? Well, if, if that were the case, you know, part of me would want to know why they wouldn't even want to be willing to share what the Powerball numbers are at that point. It, but well, they might not realize they're a ghost either, because if they're if a time slip is taking place, obviously it's a normal day for them. This person comes to visit like everybody does. And I'm sure you see all kinds that come to these uh, uh, tours. That person, the, the tour guide, may not have even realized that they were talking to somebody out of place and time. And to them, the gift shop was closed. Because that's kind of a weird thing for a pre-period ghost to say, don't you think? It is, yeah. Yeah. But, but very um, cool, nonetheless. Just something to think about. I like to throw in those little mind grenades from time to time and get you get you chewing on that. So that was one of the more popular uh, stories, one of the ones that freaked you out. What are some of the other cool ghost stories associated? Well, I mean, there, there, there's a whole bunch of them. Like, um, you know, the, uh, the Jane Hotel in New York actually has um, what I probably theorize is more of a residual. But, um, you know, that's where the uh, crew members, the surviving crew members, uh, actually stayed at when they uh, came when Carpathia came into New York and such. Oh, and wow. uh, so these days, uh, guests have you know, mentioned about seeing people wandering the halls in uniform, um, sounds of sobbing from the hallway, shadow figures, you know, uh, pretty much almost the whole gamut of um, anything that you can expect to find uh, with a, with your typical haunting. That's pretty cool. Now, was there any um, reports at all from Cameron or the crew that while filming Titanic, any kind of strange paranormal phenomena took place that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, no. But um, I can say this much. The closest that I can have in terms of that aspect, um, you know, I do have a, uh, one, of, one of my uh, friends that I had kind of talked on off the record uh, worked on one of the expeditions at the wreck site. And he said that uh, it was one of those things where when they uh, got to the uh, scene on, at that particular point in time, you know, if you were to do it by the chronological aspect of it, you know, Titanic would have already been in the midst of going under. And, you know, he said that for a, about a fraction of a second, he thought he saw lifeboats in the water. Wow. So... You know, that kind of opens up, again, another plausibility, because as as you know, you know, I mean, water is known for being one of the best conductors, especially for things in this field. Right. Now, at these ex exhibitions, are they showing actual artifacts from Titanic or are these reimagined or what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, yeah, recreations of the actual artifacts. Well, if, if you see um, anything that's listing with a company called RMS Titanic Incorporated, then those are the actual artifacts that have been recovered. But if you see anything that says Dave and Chachi's Titanic exhibit-ish, then you should question yeah. things a little more. Yeah. But still yeah, go. I'm, I'm pretty cool. There. Yeah, hey, right. Hey, go. <laughs> it, it would still be worth it. I mean, I, I might even buy the season pass. So <laughs> excellent. I like the sound of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, selling those, Dave. So that's good. Yeah. Chachi, get on the t shirt that says, check out my Titanics and just have two ships pointing out. What do you think? Exactly. You know, Next week, yeah. I, I, I know at least two or 300 people that would buy it just for the word Titanic. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, now, when it comes to the, the, 
history and and obviously you're going to be doing a much bigger presentation on this tell people where they can see you and hear a much longer uh presentation and more into the haunted history of titanic well on uh february 23rd i'm going to be speaking at an overnight event uh, at the cox science center in west palm beach florida where the artifacts exhibition is currently uh on tour and uh, it's called the uh, ship of dreams sleepover and i'm going to be uh you know basically sharing uh, all the ghost stories and all the hauntings and uh even throwing in some random film trivia along the way as well too um you know you, you remember friday the 13th the series yes did you ever see the uh episode called what a mother wouldn't do probably at some point in my storied history but i'm not even quite sure what i did eight minutes ago <laughs> let alone what i watched 20 years ago when the series came out but do tell what's the cool bit of trivia well for that particular episode um they actually filmed it uh just around the same time that titanic was discovered so obviously that added as the tie-in it was uh basically a, a cradle that supposedly was recovered in the debris field and you know there was a mother that bought it who had a sick child and the curse to it was the fact that the mother had to drown people in order to keep the child alive oh geez <laughs> yeah i think i remember that episode very weird the uh the yeah. titanic why do you think people still i mean you know, I, there's tragedies that have befallen us, like the the Hindenburg, and so many other uh, horrific things that have taken place. Why is Titanic so romanticized? Well, I, I think it's because of the fact that um, you know that this was of the age where you know for, for what they would call the men were men. You know, um, if you had a 16 year old son in the eyes of society, he was considered an adult, and so. You know, uh, when you look at the uh, statistics as well, too, and, you know, this was often used as a discussion point, uh, you know, just even about a decade ago when the uh, Costa Concordia accident happened. And, mm -hmm. you know, people were trying to say this was just like Titanic when, you know, if you look at the uh, stats, it's a far cry. Um, in Titanic's case, 80 percent of the crew stayed at their posts all the way through. Mm -hmm. And Concordia, on the other hand, well crew were the first ones to uh, jump ship, you know, pretty much almost immediately. <laughs> kind of like the uh, co-hosts of the news here on Paranormal 60. <laughs> Very few hold their posts. So, Dave, do you, do you think it has to do with the wealth on that ship? Right? I mean, the Hindenburg didn't have a bunch of wealthy people on it, right? Actually, it did, though, right? Because you yeah. had to be kind of wealthy to be able to travel by, uh, by the that dirigibles. Part? So I don't know. I would think there would have been more animosity towards the rich that were taking advantage of these uh, opportunities. None of these people could, uh, you know, the the, uh, the common folk could afford to do. So I don't know that. I, I you know, so maybe you it's just it the, the scope of the tragedy of the whole thing is that you have the unsinkable ship and just the mm -hmm. irony uh, involved in this and that it did seem to touch so many people. And there wasn't news, I guess, blasting us uh, you know on a 24 7 news cycle like there has been over the last 30 years so that was a, a story that was massive and really kind of captured the attention of the world at the time and generations talked about the tragedy of titanic and then the movies that came out romanticized it i guess and there were books that kind of romanticized it and then you've got you know the the James Cameron movie, which kind of resealed it with a whole new generation of people. So that probably has a little bit more to do with it. I don't remember learning and, about it in school. No, well, it wasn't an important part of our American history so much as it was just a you know it had nothing to do with wartime. Had it been a, a ship that was shot, and and I think that there was some conspiracy regarding that too, right, William? That there may have been uh, a torpedo that that took out the Titanic at one point. Well, uh, there there was that at one point, and then um, I mean, that's there, four things, I, right? You could have at least a uh, a six month running show just on the conspiracies alone. Um, we have everything from our variation of the Lindbergh baby, um, you know, Federal Reserve conspiracy, 
uh, murder, the whole shabam. I mean, it's it, it's pretty much the uh, creative writer's dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, very cool. Thank yeah. you for coming on, sharing a little bit of your knowledge. Do you have a quick question, Chachi? I, I have one quick question. Do you happen to own any relics from the, the Titanic? Yes, I do, actually. Um, I was originally friends with uh, four of the survivors, and uh, I'm friends with roughly about a half a dozen of the families. So, uh, And you know, if you don't mind me asking, can you share what you, what you own? Well, yeah. Um, you know, for the for the most part, um, you know, we 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 share a lot of things together. So I have um, a few pieces of the ship herself, uh, hmm. some couple of photographs. Um, probably the most obscure thing that I have is actually a a, a frog wearing scuba gear holding onto a Titanic life preserver, which is for the aquarium. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> You know, but uh, but Dave, I'm surprised that uh, you you actually sold the, uh, the the Titanic board game. You'd be surprised what that's going for these days. Ah, um, uh, no. Do I want to know how that. much how much is that going for now? Uh, cl closer to about a thousand. <laughs> how many years ago did you sell it, Dave? <laughs> Just a couple of years back, Ooh. like maybe 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 the year or so before COVID hit. Oh, oh, geez, wow. yeah. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, me memorabilia is always um, one of the biggest commodities. Uh, you know, I, I have a, uh, another friend who's a, a full-time collector. And, you know, at one point, he actually owned uh, a piece of the Grand Staircase, which uh, is worth oh, multiple. I thought, that, I thought that was considered like a, a specialty. Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for, William? Um, I, I thought they weren't allowed to do that. There was they got some rights for it for the movie, but I thought that kind of bringing anything up was kind of uh, breaking laws somewhere. Well, yeah, you can't bring anything up from the wreck. That's true. But mm -hmm. what happened was uh, right after uh, the ship went down, there was a cable company out of uh, Halifax called uh, you know, and they sent out a ship called the McKay Bennett. Mm -hmm. And so as they went to go re to retrieve the bodies, they also found a lot of floating debris. So the crew members helped themselves to that along the way. And then that stayed in the families over the course of the generations. Wow. All right. Fascinating stuff. William, thank you so much for spending some time here with us today. Well, thank you as well for having me. And, uh, you know, definitely, guys. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna, I'll, gonna, I'll send you that beer. You did pretty good. We, get, we hit the four for four mark. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. We'll have a link up for uh, William and how you can find out more about his presentation. And if you're in that area, go on out and see it and see the Titanic exhibit. Chachi, we've been to what uh, two or three sites where the Titanic visited, right? In was it Ireland and England? England, I think. In Ireland or was it Ireland or Scotland? It was one of the stops along the way because we remember we went and they had the big fence and we were all looking over and trying to see into it it's another I one of those it. days man if only we had an expert who could pop in and explain to us where <laughs> we oh william where was it was it ireland or scotland where they've got that uh exit i think it's ireland right it's it's it's, it's ireland and that and that's actually another haunted spot too so right uh, if, you, if you if you head over there you can always ask that manager they might be a little bit more open I did. I think I think we did talk to him a little bit about it, and they, they shared some stories while we were there. Uh, sorry to bring you back, William. We didn't mean to continue to conjure you, but thank you for giving me that info. Oh, no worries. All right. Take care. Uh, yeah, very cool stuff, man. Um, it, it is weird how some tragedies... I remember the Hindenburg movie, you watched it, you heard the tragic uh, recordings, and the, the original recordings exist out there, and I think it was a a radio show host from Chicago, and it might have been WLS or WGN radio, where he's talking and he's openly sobbing. Oh, the humanity, the tragedy of the lives that are lost. And he's like crying it out. He ended up losing his job because he was not being journalistic in his response. I thought that's got to be one of the most human responses to any tragedy, if you're watching this thing come up and it just ignites and you're watching people leap to their deaths, 
Um, and I guess the hangar where they kept the uh, the wreckage is quite haunted. One of the shows did an investigation. I want to say it was I want to say it was Ghost Hunters um, that did the uh, did the the paranormal investigation there. But uh, you know, there are some places like that. You know, we we were out in Germany and we got to visit a few sites that were, you know, very powerful. And yeah. you kind of feel like, yeah, I could run a recorder right now, but I just felt like the solemn presence of, no, I just, I want to be in this moment. And remember, I mean, there was one point we're standing there and there's like the, you can stand in the footprints where Adolf Hitler stood. Uh, and, on the parade grounds. Right. And, and yeah, yeah. we all kind of had that weird feeling and I went and I stepped on it. And I was like, I, I don't know how I feel about this, but I kind of feel like, you know, it's not like I'm trying to connect with Adolf Hitler, but just to stand in the place overlooking the view he saw and just to try to make sense of it to me is more of how I felt it, hoping that maybe, hoping above hope I could stand in that spot and maybe get some kind of psychic impression to, was this guy possessed? Was he that mentally broken was there any insight you could get i got nothing and i'm sure there's been 22 billion people that have stood in that place but it just was um yeah there's some of these places that it just i don't know you know the titanic obviously we we worked hard to get into the exhibit for the show um and i understand that there's some you know popularity with that stuff but again where it comes into the tragedies of of things and maybe it's because it's far enough out that it was what did he say 112 years ago you know there's no real survivors You're, you've got third generation now since that uh tragedy took place so it's not as raw and fresh for people but i don't know I, 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 yeah I, I just can't get into investigating some of those places i think about when we were at the the parade grounds there and I yeah. remember going up to, to his podium, if you will. And, and what I just remember seeing was the unbelievable power that he must have been commanding over the thousands of people cheering his name in the parade grounds and, and just going that, that power going to his head. That, that's what I felt up there. Yeah. And, and now they're turning it into what what was it? They're, they're trying to was demolish. Like a, it. Was it like a race racetrack, track, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And they're not trying to demolish. I think they they have like bands that play there, and and it's a racetrack. Very weird. To, yeah, exactly. I don't know. It, to me, though, is that a place you preserve, or is it a place you till under and build something else there that is more about celebrating life? I, you know, I don't know because I think like it's in some instances. I know we got into that in our country here with taking down statues and. And, and kind of separating ourselves from the past. And in some instances, I don't think it's necessary that we need to celebrate the statues, but to remember these people and what they were capable of doing and leading. And, you know, sometimes there's, I think there's something to wanting to preserve that because people will have a hard time when you, you know, here's, here's maybe a good example. Um, when, Tragedy strikes the East Coast or the West Coast. You and I are watching on the news going, geez, oh my God, that's horrible. And then we turn off the news and we're having dinner with our family and it's kind of already out of our mind in a way. And that's not meant to sound dismissive, but it's, it's, you have this separate sense. You're, you're dis, can, you know, disconnected from the immediacy of it. So I think if we remove too many of these things, even though they've got a bad, reputation or a bad psychical scar i think that you distance yourself from that and it kind of becomes like not real if that makes sense i, I can see how you would feel that way certainly um but what, what then you think about those people that are there where it's happening right and and right it's almost now we're going down a rabbit hole here, but it's almost like social media these days, right? You can scroll through and see a terrible story, and then you go to the next story, and it's a really yeah. powerful story, the very positive. And you scroll to the next story, and it's bad. It's yeah, yeah. It's it's very weird, you know. Our and again, I, I'm not advocating to uh, retain 
statues and memories to celebrate, uh, but to mark things and and to remember where we came from so that you can, you know, you see the statue of that person or you stand in those golden footprints as a way to remember that somebody, somebody drastically altered the way the world ran from this exact spot. And although we're far removed from it, you know, going on almost, you know, we're closing in on a hundred years, you know, what are we, 80, 90 years um, from World War II. And, and to wow. just think, you know, World War I was a hundred years ago now, right? Very a little, little uh, under or a little over a hundred years ago. And World War II was pretty much on its heels. Um, there's, there's that, I think that's why I, I try to understand people and I've had people reach out to me to want to do the show that are Holocaust deniers. And, you know, it's like telling me Sandy Hook didn't happen or, you know, 9-11 didn't happen, uh, you know, that it was a bomb or this or that. Or I think that it removes the tragedy of what happened to the people involved by taking the focus off of the attacks themselves. And I, I know I'm I'm walking a razor thin line here, and there are people in our fan base that like conspiracies and buy into that. And we've been kind of trailing on that for the last few weeks here on the news, talking about different elements of conspiracy. Um, but sometimes I don't know where do you stand on the concept? Do we keep some things that are horrific so that we're we're reminded of the horrors, so that hopefully we don't do them again, and we don't distance ourselves so far from them that there's, you know, there's no connection to it anymore. I, I'm, I'm right there. It's let us not forget what happened, right? Yeah. We're, we're, what does the, the say? We're doomed to repeat it. Um, yeah. Because yeah, what's I mean, more, what's more uh, horrific that we bulldoze it and put in a dance club, and it's kind of like, oh, does that feel right either? You know, do we do we remove something? And then there's one side of me that says it's let's turn this into a happy thing. Let's try to decompose the psychic scar and implant new happy loving memories there uh, but does that do a service to history itself and the people whose lives were lost due to the decisions made at those moments it's like i think about the 9 11 memorials i mean to me yeah. those are some of the most beautiful memorials i have ever seen right you if you've been there and if you haven't it's very worth going is you get the footprint of the building Right? You understand they kept the size there. You you look around and you can see what everybody saw that day. Um, and so we haven't forgotten about it. But there's so many things. And, and forget about the statues. Is there's things where events happened where, to your point, we have just bulldozed it and, and put up a, a dance club. And 100 years from now, nobody will remember that happened. And we're doomed to repeat it because nobody remembers that it happened. Put your comments uh, in the in the show below here if you're watching it on YouTube. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Um, you know, it's so hard. I, I I even have a trouble trying to pose the question because I don't want to be. I don't want whitewash, and I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to trigger. Uh, I just, where do you stand on these things, folks? Where where should we be? Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. Uh, we've got an interesting prediction made by an unlikely source coming up uh, regarding the Super Bowl this weekend. And then I want to talk about some of these other uh, news stories that kind of popped up. Chachi and I'll be back. Stay tuned. You're listening to the very best in paranormal programming. I'm Dave. That's Chachi. And this is the Paranormal 60 News. In winter's grasp, a chilling tale unfolds. Wanted Magazine's issue 40, Secrets to be Told. Al Capone's ghost, in shadows it creeps. A spectral mobster, where darkness seeps. Fourteen signs of a poltergeist's might. Haunting whispers in the silent night. Pascagoula UFO. Fifty years gone by. A cosmic encounter. Reaching the sky. A ghost train of Tate Bridge. Echoes in the mist. A phantom journey. Where souls exist. Wanted magazine issue 40. 
is out now. Available from selected outlets and bit.ly forward slash haunted magazine. Don't be normal, be paranormal. Why not have a night of strange encounters? You can get the brand new book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness by Dave Schrader. It's out and available now. You can get yourself a copy at paranormal60.com. Get yourself a standard copy for just $20 or a signed copy for only $30 plus $7.95 shipping and handling. You can go order your copies right now at paranormal60.com. You love the stories that you hear on this show. You want the creepy stories to share with your family and friends around the fire. This is the book for you. Pick up Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness, wherever you buy your books or directly from my website at paranormal60.com. All right, let's get to it. Our good friend, Scotty Davis, the medium who's been a guest on the show, is a good friend of mine. He, uh, you know, Dalen Spratt, who I'm going to be working with soon, does the graveyard shift where he takes a spirit box into cemeteries and sees who wants to come through. And he has had some powerful experiences and stories. And when Scott told me what he was going to do, I was like, wow, all right. And I was surprised at the results he got. Uh, I don't want to give too much away because I, I, but check this out, Chachi. The Super okay. Bowl's coming up. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's, it's this weekend. You've got the Kansas City Chiefs against the San Francisco 49ers. It's a leap year. And the last time these two teams faced off against each other was the last leap year, if I remember correctly. Four years ago? All right. Something like that. Yeah, it's really weird, right? So there's all of these strange little synchronicities that line up. Where do you stand? I'm going to put you on the on the, the point right now, prediction time. Chachi, who do you believe is going to win the Super Bowl? Well, so uh, I think last week or the week before, everybody saw I had my Baltimore Ravens glass. Right. Uh, I've been a Ravens season ticket holder since the year they came in the league. Mm -hmm. I thought they had a tremendous year. They, I think they beat the Chiefs earlier in the year. Right. And my wife said, who's going to win the AFC championship, the Ravens or the Chiefs? And I said, somehow, the Chiefs always find a way to win. Yeah. Always. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going with the Chiefs. All right. So you're going for the Super Bowl. You think the Chiefs yes. have got it this year. All right. All right. Well, I, too, am a Patrick Mahomes fan, and there is something electric about that guy. Uh, he is, uh, he's is he got that same caliber of intensity and excitement during a big game as Tom Brady, of Brett Favre, and even Aaron Rodgers, Joe Montana, where you can see these guys in the clutch, and when they get behind, most quarterbacks, you can see the defeat written across their face. And these guys, it almost seems to stoke the embers. So to me, I think Patrick Mahomes has got this year wrapped. But let's see what the source that Scotty Davis went to says about this. What's up, everybody? My name is Scott. I'm a medium and a psychic. And today, I'm here at the very famous Vince Lombardi's burial site. The reason I'm here today is I thought, you know, we're coming up on the big game. And would Mr. Lombardi have a prediction for us? And since I'm also a paranormal investigator, I brought a, a special piece of equipment and I'm going to ask Mr. Lombardi if he has a prediction for us for the big game this coming weekend. Let's see what he has to say. So, Mr. Lombardi, what do you have to say? Who do you think is going to win the big game this weekend? Thank you, sir. I appreciate you giving us some sort of answer. And with that, I guarantee you, whether you are right or wrong, I'll be back next year to ask you again. Thank you. I appreciate you. So according to the recording, and if you're watching it, you could see it along with it. Um, and if you're listening to it, powerful. I'm going to actually put that video up on my social media. And Scotty allowed me, I'm going to put that video up on our page so that it's there standing alone so you can go back and watch the video and see for yourself and listen to the audio coming through but chachi it clearly said 49ers a few times the niners 49ers, niners, niners i got clear yeah yeah so vince lombardi's ghost or whoever was there at the side of his grave is calling out the 49ers you and i went chiefs let's see who knows football better 
after next week. We'll have to talk. I'm going to be it. really disappointed if you and I got it wrong <laughs> and yeah. Lombardi got it right. Yeah. Uh, although if Vince Lombardi is calling it, you can't be too upset that that's the guy we lost to. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Very how many, cool. How many championships he have? I'm just putting you on the spot because you were so good with the Titanic trivia. I thought maybe you'd yeah, know. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Vince Lombardi, wasn't it like six? I was going to say four. Somebody That's put it in the right. comments. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, again, you a know. Sports show. That's a different show. No, course. I really kind of got into football in 1985 when I lived in Chicago and the Bears won. And then I kind of stayed away from football again until the 90s when I moved to the Twin Cities. And uh, for my job, I had a sports job uh, and my territory was Minnesota. And in that cl cluster of years, we had the NCAA Final Four, the Super Bowl. We had the Stanley Cup championships. We had uh, all kinds of things taking place all under the auspice of sports in Minnesota for a very, you know, clustered time for like two years. Uh, World Series. So um, I fell in love with uh, the Vikings football and uh, just became a fan of that. And I can tell you, we've been to the Super Bowl four times and lost four times. So what's interesting here, Dave, is, is you yeah. and I are, are somewhat kindred spirits. Mm -hmm. And the first year I got into football was 1985. And the only reason I know this is because I lived up in Boston area, huge New England Patriots fan. And during the season, I moved down to Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching the Super Bowl at a friend's house. And I remember we scored first, the Patriots. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember or not, we proceeded to not score another single point. And I think you beat us like 28 to 3 or 48 to 3. Now, so, I think it was 307 to 3. If I'm I, I, someone check in real fast, if you don't mind, I'll go back and check. Something comments. stupid. Wasn't it something like 52 to three or something ridiculous? I think it was like 48 to three or something like that. Yeah. yeah. We scored first. And I remember just, you know, give it to my buddy. And then that was the last point. Maybe we had an expert. We could ask to look oh. that information up. No, Mr. He's Montana? Not. Oh, no. hang on. Let's see. Okay. Google. <laughs> what was the final score of the Chicago bears? 1985 Super Bowl. 46 to 10, according to NFL 100, NFL.com. The Fridge, the 1985 Chicago Bears. All right, that's enough. She gets so chatty. I don't know, know why we do a show. Let's just AI do it for us. Right, just have, I wonder how many how many people's uh, devices just turned on when I said that to them. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Ready? Yep. Alexa, order Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness by Dave Schrader. And have it sent to me immediately. One moment. The first one is Theater of the Mind. Tales from the Darkness, Ghosts, UFOs, Aliens, Monsters, and other strange stories of the supernatural. Excellent. Cancel that order. No, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Yeah, that's oh, awesome. That's awesome. All right. So let's let's talk about this. Uh I this is kind of interesting to me. I I'm right really intrigued by technology and Love the it. way it's going. Some things, you know, they just made that big deal out of the fact that uh, Patient Zero was just revealed. Uh, Elon Musk had that brain chip put into a human now. Right? Did you hear about that? I did not see that story. What happened? You should, yeah, you should research uh, those stories. They're pretty impressive. I, so, yeah, the very first person to get the chip is out there and amongst us. At least the first one that they're admitting to. Yeah. And so who who implanted it? What company? I think it was Elon himself. Oh, yeah, he used like uh I think he used the the tongs and poker from the um you know operation game and just put it in himself. I could be wrong. Again, I don't have all the information. <laughs> I think that's that. about 500, which isn't too bad. So Right. And that was in itself I I didn't really talk about that because I know that's just divisive because people are going to yeah, I don't want to be affected blah 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 blah. This this topic and we could talk about the brain chip in a week or two when we get the full complement of uh crew back here but this one was intriguing to me because of how powerful dreams are to us in the paranormal right so real life inception headband lets you control your dreams but experts fear zapping the brain with this two thousand dollar device could hinder cognitive abilities during waking hours so in 2025 the company prophetic is introducing the Halo AI headband, priced at a staggering $2,000. Uh, 
where it offers users unprecedented control over their dreams. Using EEG and fMRI technologies, the headband creates a detailed brain map to induce lucid dreams, where individuals are aware they're dreaming during sleep. Prophetic CEO Eric Wahlberg emphasizes that the headband uh, facilitates these lucid dreams without user intervention, delivering high-frequency sounds during REM sleep to induce and sustain the experience. So for people that don't know, lucid dreaming is in the dream when you become somewhat cognizant, you become aware that you're in a dream and you're controlling it. If you remember, I think it was like Nightmare on Elm Street for the dream warriors, right? Where they're going into their dreams to try to control. And that was one of my favorites because it was just such a campy, corny. Was uh, that the one where Dawkins wrote the uh, dream warriors song? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the concept of, of controlling your dreams, and I personally am excited about this because I have lucid dreams. I, I have dreams where I'm very aware that I'm in the dream state. And sometimes I just roll with it and I try not, as a matter of fact, I consciously try not to think about the fact that I'm in the dream state because as soon as I concentrate on that, I, I start to come out of it. Like I fly a lot in my dreams. I fly a lot. And as soon as I start becoming hyper aware, oh shoot, this is a dream because I'm flying so much, I start lowering. And it's like at some point, literally I'm flying six inches above the ground because I'm, I'm holding on to it as hard as I can to try to keep that ability to fly, but it's like consciousness is is bringing me back down to earth, Lady literally. Yeah. Okay. So I love the concept of being able to control your dreams. One of my favorite movies is Dreamscape. Do you remember that movie? Is that the one with Beyonce? Absolutely no. That was Dream oh, Girls. Cool. Wasn't I apologize. I don't know. Uh, Dreamscape that had uh, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank on his name. Quaid, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid or Randy Quaid? No, Dennis Quaid. And it had uh, the girl from the second Indiana Jones movie, yeah, uh, Kate Capshaw. Um, and Eddie Albert was the president. Uh, but the whole concept was that they had found a way to enter the dream state and manipulate dreams. So this, this scientific approach was being used to try to help uh, people dealing with nightmares and PTSD, but then they started to find ways that they could go in and like the enemy was going in and affecting the president's dreams and his decisions, which is kind of a cool concept. So that's always been interesting to me. So it goes on with this article and it says that uh, Wahlberg emphasizes that the headband will facilitate the lucid dreams. Despite the innovative concept, experts, though, express concerns about the potential long-term effects, particularly cautioning against using high-frequency sounds to stimulate the brain. Professor Mark Blagrove from Swansea University notes the uncertainty surrounding the necessity of non-lucidity for dreams uh, and the effective function. Dreams believed to contribute to emotional processing and cognitive development may face interference with induced lucidity, raising worries about negative consequences like heightened stress and worsened sleep. So there is that element though, but if you're having a nightmare and you can alter that nightmare and get yourself out of it, that seems good to me. However, when you realize, Chachi, a lot of times the nightmares that you're in are telling more about your awake cycle and can actually help you understand better what it is you're facing, the fear that you're dealing with. And in the in the awake cycle, it by evaluating your dreams, it can give you a better handle on ways to handle things in your waking life. So I think that there's there's definitely interesting elements, the sci-fi excitement element of being able to be more aware makes me wonder if we are doing this simultaneously, your bed next to me, I'm on the other bed. We both do this. Can we merge and have a shared sleep experience? Um, so some of those things are really cool. And more importantly, I wonder about the practicality of, or, or the possibility rather, maybe is the better word. What if we did this to coma patients? Could that give the coma patient the ability to wake themselves up? Because if it, if it, is pinging and giving consciousness. If you're in a coma state, are you aware you're in a coma state? 
Are you just dreaming? Are you void and checked out? What is it that can bring you back out of it? So it's just, I think there's some really compelling arguments to be made for, for this kind of technology. And I wonder if they're even thinking about that in the way of trying to communicate with uh, coma patients or trying to help them elevate their consciousness back into a communicative way. As usual, you are 12 steps ahead of me. I try. Here's a really cool, I don't know if you you know this, you know who Mel Blank is, right? Uh, he was the voice of Bugs Bunny. Yeah, he was a man of 10,000 voices, right? He did Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, Speedy Gonzalez, all of the Foghorn Leghorn. He was the Looney Tunes crew. Right? He was Warner Brothers, right? Right. Never did Disney stuff. I, I, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, right. So he was in a horrible car accident, and this is a legitimate story. His son has talked about it. It's, it's been out there. He was in a horrible car accident and was in a coma and was not responding to medical uh, practices to try to get him roused out of it. The doctor had an idea, and he approached Mel Blank, and he said, Mr. Blank, um, I know you seem to be busy right now, but I'm wondering if Bugs Bunny can come talk to me. And all of a sudden, Mel Blank goes, eh, what's up, doc? And starts in speaking. Coma? To, yes, in a coma, speaks to him as Bugs Bunny. He was connecting to a different part of the consciousness that brought him out, and that helped elevate him back into a state of living consciousness. And so, so eventually, he, those types of questions got him out of the coma? Right, getting him to engage a wow. different part of the brain. Because if there's damage to one part of the brain that may be affecting your communication, but the imagination sector is a different part of the brain, and you're pinging that, and Bugs Bunny lives there, which sounds silly, but in that concept of who we are, what we think of and do, it might be an interesting element. You know, like my kids say, there is definitely a difference between dad and darkness Dave. There is the the homebody Dave. And then like when I pick up the phone, I go right into this voice and I'm this character. And I'm like, no, I'm the, I'm the same guy. They're like, no, dad, you're really not. It's two different deals. So I wonder if I were to go into a coma, you can't get me to effectively communicate. What would it be if you tried to communicate with the darkness Dave element of who I am, the entertainer? So if they don't try it, Chachi, it's up to you. Oh, don't you worry. I'll have Greg right beside me. Oh, God. <laughs> You're like, nope, I'm going back. <laughs> I think I saw him open his eye. No, no, he didn't. Nope, definitely not him. That um, is an anyway. crazy story. I'm going to look more up about that. But oh, yeah, it's a great story. What? Ballpark, how many years ago did that happen? And I know you're uh, going to be off Well, it was before he died. Years. So, yeah, no, it was it was a long time ago. I want to say it was like the 50s or 60s. Wow. So for a doctor to do that 60, 70 years ago, that's yeah. amazing. Okay. He was trying to engage a different element of the brain, and that's the artistic yeah. side, right? That's why I said in a coma state, I would think with the way you and I love music, it might be intriguing to try to stimulate awareness with the music. And there have been coma patients who they've played songs and tears start to trickle down because the emotional aspect of the consciousness is still there, which makes you wonder how much of awareness is there in those states. It's really strange. Some people have come out of comas and said, I heard and saw everything. Others just seem to wake up and it's like it's tomorrow and they went to sleep yesterday and now it's 20 years later or five years later, or two weeks later. So it's really kind of an intriguing element to the brain. But I would think music would be one. I've, I've said one of the things that I think would bring me out of a coma is there are two noises. One is the old telephone ring, that old... Okay. I used to hate that noise, and it drives me. I want to answer that phone just to stop it. That, and then, do you remember back in the day when you take your phone off the hook, what would have to happen after about a minute of it off the hook? Would it be, 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 be. Yeah, you kind of get that eh, 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 yeah. screeching noise, which was to let you know you left the phone off the hook. But that noise was so disorienting and weird to me. It used to freak me out. So I would think one of those two noises would definitely jar me back out of my, my or it would drive me completely insane that I couldn't come out of it. Ooh, to stop it. That's a risk I don't know if I want to take. 
Right. Uh, again, so I'll, I'll bring the paranormal detective in for that. that that's not no, right. no, because he'll just stand there and be yeah, Greg. Exactly. And, and, hey, real yeah. fast. I, I, I know to your point, we're, we're recording, but anybody that's watching, if you've got a good book on someone who's written a book about their experience being in a coma, I would love you to drop in the comments because I would love to read some about that. This is kind of all new to me. I, I haven't heard these things. Yeah. Uh, Prophetic initiates a beta test application for the Halo headband. They prioritized pre-order customers. As the release approaches, users are urged to weigh the enticing prospect of dream control against the potential risks, emphasizing the need for caution and a comprehensive understanding of the technology's impact on individuals. Do you think most individuals are going to really stop to think the people that want it are going to get it? I don't think they're going to put in the effect of, oh, because people, we want control i can't i don't know man i can't tell you for sure if they gave to me how much thought i would put into what's the possible long-term effect i i don't know so Interesting. here's the thing at right. our age right which some may say is an advanced age dave <laughs> so i didn't say we would say that some may say that right the the possible long-term effects would they hit us before our natural progression through life would hit us I don't know. So like, if we don't ask the question, do no. Yeah. If we don't ask the question, theoretically, we won't find out the answer. So we'll be okay. Let me drop this little. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, don't ask what you don't want to know. I like that. Right. If I can um, make sure. Well, yeah. The, the old saying is never ask a question you don't know the answer to. No, because you don't want you know, the answer to. Well, there's that too. <laughs> but how about this for a concept? That utilizing this equipment i could see a movie being made like um uh, gosh what was that one uh the, the the movie that was made in the late 80s early 90s it had julia roberts and Kiefer sutherland and um all of them were, they were inducing death and then inducing bringing death. themselves back out of it you remember that they would each one wanted to try it and then each one wanted to go a little bit longer into death oh. and then they would bring them back Oh God, you you've never seen that movie? Kiefer Sutherland and Julia. It was an all-star casting crew. I think there's Oliver Platt, Kiefer Sutherland, Julia Roberts, and there are more. And I feel bad that I can't recall who they are, but it's a really intriguing concept of them killing themselves to have this near-death experience, this out-of-body experience, and then bringing them back. And uh did you find the information? Flatliners? Flatliners. That's perfect. Yeah. How about this? Um, Alexa, remind Chachi to watch the movie Flatliners and then buy the book, The uh, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness, immediately. It said you have a reminder. It's what it said. Oh, nice. Very good. Um there's my reminder. Thanks. Wow. They waited three seconds to remind me to go buy your book. That's great, Dave. <laughs> so seriously, check this out. What if we use this technology? I wonder if you could rent it. Like if I don't want to buy it, if I have a rich friend. The paranormal detective. Could buy this piece of equipment and then let me use it. Sweat it all up and then give it back. Um, you got to wipe that down. What, what about this? What about going into the dream realm? To connect to past life. I would do it in a second. Yes. So in get one. It's only $2,000, Chachi. How, How much is that new Apple Vision Pro thing? It's like $5,000, right? Yeah, right. This is yeah. much I'll better. You and I both won. Yeah. Awesome. It's better than VR. We could go in together and visit each other's past lives. Do, do we have super stickers on? Because we need those on right now. Yeah. Super stickers. Okay, super <laughs> idea stickers. We need all of that. Yeah. Start start kicking into the Dave and Chachi Dream Warrior uh, category and make those donations now. I will say as soon as we get two grand, I will use that money to buy this. Now, I, I do have to tell you, yes. uh, you always ask me to read my stories ahead of time. And unlike yes. our friend, the paranormal detective, I do read my stories. Okay. But tonight, for the first time, I decided to have a drink while I was reading my stories. Usually, I wait to the show. No, 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 I wait to the show. Okay. And I was reading the story, and it said that in 2025, the company Prophetic introduces the Halo AI husband. And then I kept reading. And I misread headband as husband. And I was like, 
how are they getting a husband to do these things? <laughs> and now I know you read the story properly. So thank you. Yes, that's why I'm reading the story. And not, oh, not me. Uh, all right, let's get through these last two. Look at this. Even with just two of us, we're going over. It just, how can this, that be? Wednesday night. Football. Yeah, time is time slip malleable. We can manipulate time to our own ways. Uh, Do you think we'll ever change the name of the show to the Paranormal 90? Just wondering. No, no okay. because A, people think I named it the Paranormal 60 because they think I'm 60, which still kind of hurts. So if I call it the Paranormal 90, I'm not ready I for that. heard that. That's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way you're 60. Uh, in the realm of social media, where the eerie often goes viral, TikTok user Efron Esqueda. Sorry, my Hispanic friends. We need Marty. Yeah. <laughs> Marty doesn't know Spanish at all. I love how you always Latin it, friend though. I have. <sighs> yeah. I remember once I'm like, can you give me a burrito? He's like, is that German? Um, <laughs> Efron Esqueda has become the talk of town. His daring adventure involved pushing the boundaries of the supernatural by engaging in five consecutive days of Ouija board sessions, a tool known for contacting entities from beyond. Efren, sharing his escapade on TikTok, recounted his spine-chilling experience after purchasing the Ouija board from Mexico City's Sonora Market, which is a hub for witchcraft and magic-related products. Uh, what, what, what are you giving me? You the don't slip want to buy stuff from there. No? No. I do. So Remind me when we have the paranormal detective back. He told me a story about that place. I don't remember the details. But oh, really? Asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. He claimed the table moved mysteriously and connected with a spirit named Tamara, who, according to the TikToker, met her demise in a 1956 car accident. As the days unfolded, followers were captivated. Captivated? They was captivated, sir. I don't know what I do for you. I turned into mush mouth from uh, the the Cosby kids there. As the days unfolded, followers were captivated by Efren's tales of disturbing dreams, unexplained phenomena, and the sudden toll on his health. The TikTok enthusiast described objects falling, doors opening, and even a shadow from his childhood reappearing during sessions. He detailed feeling tired, experiencing headaches, and discovering scratches on his body. The climax of the story involved a presence entering his body, leading to strange actions that he claims were not voluntary. Efren then introduced a second entity, uh, Belce, or Belce, B-E-L-C-E, -E, uh, who supposedly provided a date for its impending demise. The story shared on social media has ignited debates about the thin line between reality and the paranormal. I don't think I like the way that that article states that, between reality and the paranormal. As viewers grapple with the authenticity of Efren Esquada's supernatural encounters, his TikTok chronicles have sparked discussions on the limits of paranormal exploration and the potential consequences of meddling with forces beyond our understanding. If only we had an expert that could answer us a few questions about Ouija boards. Welcome to the show. Nope, no nobody's one. here. No. Uh, this is what I do know. I think, again, it has a lot to do with the intention you put into what you're doing. This guy is probably trying to drive. I'm speculating. Understand, I'm speculating. This guy's probably trying to drive some viewers to his TikTok account. And are people going to come and find furry bunnies and unicorns, or are they wanting stuff to happen to poor Efren? I'm guessing they're tuning in to see if Efren is possessed. What the latter. Kind of things yep. happen. Yeah. So, um that automatically makes me start to question the authenticity of the reports that he's giving. Now, I have friends who have been involved with using Ouija boards uh, for years, and uh, they get great results from the Ouija board. They get um, uh, direct contact, positive information. And then if, if they start getting negative responses, they simply put the game away, the board away. They close the encounter the proper way and then put the board game away, and that's it. And they take control of that situation. Uh, so they're not allowing things in. Um, I would be real careful if this guy's dicking around with it to try to get viewers and inviting things in. That could lead to some really disturbing phenomena and and inspiring himself and, and his viewers to start taking more risks with the supernatural because we've got a lot of these kids that emulate the things they see on TikTok and social media. So that is my where my real concern comes from is that he may be just jerking around to get viewers 
theoretically. Um, Allegedly. But, right. But the viewers might be taking it a lot more seriously, therefore putting themselves in harm's way. Have you ever had the uh, gentleman, uh, John, who runs the uh, Spirit Board Museum up in Salem on? Yeah, Bob Murch uh, was his partner. Oh, Bob, and, yeah, I'm sorry, Bob Murch. Yeah, we right? had Bob Murch on numerous times talking about Ouija board, and he is not one that believes that spirits are manipulating it. That's so, interesting. I, yeah. No, I was going to say, I, I was up in Salem last fall, and I got to right. spend some time there with John, and forgive me, John, I can't remember your last name. Do you remember his last name, Dave? No. Dave, no. Sorry, my camera froze. What was the question? <laughs> I was like, did I freeze or did I, I can't remember. I can't remember your real name. All, that's why I just call you Chachi all the time. Hey, Chachi. No, I was just saying, I went to the Spirit Board Museum and great stories about not so much from John, who, who runs the museum, but from folks that have given him boards and what they've experienced, much like what, we, what you just read there. Right. And I've got probably a dozen boards that have been given to me over the years because people do not want them because they've had bad experiences and I've had nothing go wrong except for financial ruin, uh, global pandemic and losing all of my hair. Otherwise everything seems to be going great. In my life. I, I pretty much look at you as the horseshoe up my behind pretty much. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no matter how bad your life gets, no matter how bad your life gets, you're like, at least I'm not Dave Schrader. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, what do you, what do you think? Would that be, you know, I remember there was a point George Nori and Rosemary Ellen Guiley were going to do an on air widget experiment on coast to coast and George yielded because of public outcry and she was very upset. She really, Rosemary Ellen Guiley really wanted to do this and kind of show the other side of this and it never took place. I believe a few other podcasts at the time took on the, the challenge. To me, it's boring. It, it takes a while to get going and see things come through. Uh, so I'm not, you know, to me, it's just the, the standing there around waiting for it to move is the boring part. Um, however, you and I had an experience when we were in Ireland, I believe it was. The absolute worst memory. Scotland. Oh, I know where you're going with this, and I can't remember where it was either. But yes, it was I in remember. Ireland, and it was in Ireland or okay. Scotland. Definitely one of those two, or Iowa. I can't be certain. Iowa. We, were, we were overseas doing one of our uh, big events, and uh, you and I were watching as they were doing table tipping. Yep. And skeptically, we were just both watching this, and it was like the table was tipping, but they had the the women that were running it were positioned on what looked like important parts of the table. Yep. And we were, we were watching this going, these, these ladies are manipulating our group, but our group was loving it. And the table oh. was bucking and moving. And we were sitting there. And uh, I remember telling you, I said, and it might've been Greg and you. And I said, I, uh, I wonder if that table would continue to jump if the ladies took their hands off it. And I said, um, what happens if you don't touch it are the spirits attached to you or will they do it? And they all put their hands up and the table kept moving. Do you remember that? And you and I were like, what the hell? And then they were doing the glass scrying. That to this day. Yeah. To this day, Dave. You know, when I first met Dave Schrader, I was a skeptic. I went on a Dave Schrader trip because my wife was a believer. And we went into the same, I think it was the same location, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. And we're watching them with this glass and it's moving around. And, and just like, so people know, for glass scrying, the tabletop is basically the Ouija board. There's letters and numbers. And then instead of a planchette, they have a, a, a turned glass that's upside down. And they're all putting their finger on the, uh, the the bottom of the glass. And they're getting messages, right? And we're watching it. And that thing was flying around the table. And I told Chachi, next time somebody steps out, you go put and put your finger on there as hard as you can so you could tell who's pulling. And if it's being pulled towards the direction of the women that are running this, we know what's going on. What happened, so, Chachi? Chachi walks over because somebody leaves, and Chachi puts his finger, and he bends that thing until his fingertip is turning purple. I had so much pressure on that glass. And I'll be darned if that thing wasn't moving. And I'm looking back at Dave. And Dave's like, push it. I'm like, Dave, I'll push it down as hard as I can. I couldn't stop it. That thing was and going it was, crazy. Oh, and it was spelling out things quick, yes. quickly. Yeah. And, and there was it was just me. 
it was me on that, and I was just I yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very to strange. Day, probably the greatest experience I've had in all the trips I've taken because I tried on. to debunk it and no amount of pressure would stop that glass from moving. Yeah. So that was very exciting, very compelling, uh, interesting to do. I would love to see more of it. We actually did this last year when we were on tour with Ann and Renata from uh, True Hauntings podcast, which can be heard That's here right. on the Animal 60. Um, they were doing uh, glass scrying. And uh, we were at at a castle, or not glass grinding, but table tipping. And again, I was very, I was questioning it. And, and a large part of our group was questioning what we were witnessing. And that table was galloping. And people that were complete and utter skeptics came up to me and they're like, Dave, I couldn't control the table. And that it moved out into the hall and put itself back where we originally got the table from is insane. And we had it on video. I'll, I'll see if I still have it. And maybe I'll upload it on this channel as well so people can watch this strange table tipping. And I know for some of you, you're going to watch it and just fight it all. And it's it's somebody's manipulating that. I'm telling you, I was there witnessing it, and I knew the people around the table. It was very, and very weird. Like with mine, you're like, Chachi, go debunk that. I'm like, I got this, Dave. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. Very yeah. cool. All right, let's. Uh, we have just about fourteen minutes before the. Actually, Dave, uh, we have negative sixteen minutes. Uh, yeah, there's that. I like that. You you see the glass is half empty. I see it as who drank my half. Um, an ex U.S. soldier spent right. time aboard a UFO and describes the privilege of ninety two days living with aliens in a captivating video that's out there circulating. Former U.S. soldier Alex Collier revealed his astonishing claim of spending three months with extraterrestrials in the late nineteen eighties. Collier, a helicopter pilot, stated that on the 92-day experience in alien time equated to just 18 minutes of Earth time. That's pretty crazy. Let's continue. How many days? 92 days. 92-day experience in alien time equated to just 18 minutes on Earth. I'd like to live there. Because if I can get that much more time out of my 18 minutes, I'll take it. Yeah, but uh, they only lived for two years, though. What? He only lived two years, though. He only lived two years. But you would only live for two years. Why? Dave, it's about time and space. And we only, have, we only have 12 minutes left in an 18-minute show here. For you to try to explain time explain, and space. And I wish I could. But again, Boy, with, with the paradigm only if we had an expert that could come on and explain it, we don't. Case. No. This wasn't Collier's first encounter with aliens. He alleges meeting two extraterrestrials in 1964 during his childhood. Falling asleep outside his grandfather's home, he woke up on a table in a darkened room, greeted by a short elderly man and a tall young man with blue skin. According to Collier, his inner... I wonder if where Greg was at that time in his life. I swear to God, I read that story and I thought the same thing. <laughs> Blue skin, now it's purple with age. Now of it's course. purple, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, according to Collier, his interactions with aliens transcend a single lifetime. He asserted that in the past life, 62,000 years ago, he fought alongside extraterrestrials in battle only to be returned to Earth and resume a normal life until encountering them again. In 1989, Collier claimed to have spent three months on the mothership of the Andromedans, believed by some UFO theorists to be humans' ancestors. Describing the 900-mile vessel, a 900-mile-long vessel. Give our listeners an idea of the distance there, Dave. That would be from where to where. Uh, I think that is from my house to the end of my driveway. I'm very bad with That's 900 miles. Yeah, very close. That's Dave Schrader money. Go ahead. Yeah, and 24 levels holographic sunrises, and a massive park. Collier detailed his observations of the extraterrestrial society, emphasizing the accelerated time perception on the ship. The UFO, as described by Collier, had remarkable technology capabilities, including transitioning into a different dimension upon crossing its threshold. While skepticism surrounds such narratives, Collier's extraordinary tale continues to fuel discussions about the intersection of human existence and the possibility of extraterrestrial encounters. Now, it's interesting because we kind of ascribe some clarity and um, a little bit more depth when you say that this is coming from an ex-soldier who was part of our military. So it's like 
immediately I read this article thinking, boy, this there's a lot more legitimacy. Although, I, you know, I'm related to former military, and some of them are the biggest nuts I've ever met in my life. Um, Allegedly. I'm not trying to be dismissive or, or a jerk, but it's like we can't just, because it was a cop, because it was a military operator, give them the concept that, well, that makes them a much more believable person. Uh, they can make mistakes as well. Although it's an interesting element all right, to hear this guy's story and to believe that it's generational, that it was part of his family that have been dealing with this for quite some time. To hear a claim come out this big, this bold, and you know, coming from somebody who's former military and knows a thing or two about flight as a helicopter uh, pilot, how much weight do you put into a story like this? You know, it's interesting. I know these two guys that have a uh, residency on a paranormal podcast that I once believed highly in because of their prior military experience. Uh, and then I get to hear some of their thoughts on things and I began to believe that they're human. I, I, I put them above human and, and now they're not. So specifically without naming names here, Dave. Um, no, not at all. I, I, I don't think I put any more legitimacy in it because he was a soldier. I think of it on the same level as any other person who has any uh, experience like this. It is funny, though. We want to believe. I'm working on a guest, uh, an actual... Um, <clears throat> an actual guest? Doctor, a doctor that had alien abduction scenarios. And this doctor also uh, excels in psychology. So it'll be interesting to talk to him and hear his thoughts about what this experience is and what it means to him. He has a new book out. I'll, I'll give out more information about it as we get closer to booking him on the show. But uh, interesting elements, right? You want to give these people kind of a wider berth of believability because of the letters that, you know, precede their name. Uh, when I was younger, I believed that. Yeah. Right? But at the yeah. end of the day, we're all humans. Lawyers, yeah. uh, doctors, uh, garbage people. It doesn't matter what your job Why'd is. Why did you look at me when you said garbage people? Why? It, it has a lot to do with something I can't talk about. Okay. So I just want to I just want to focus on the story tonight, Dave. But no, it doesn't matter what your job is. Right. Job has got nothing to do with your IQ. And, and I will say, what I, what I love about this show is when you read the comments, and I wish we were live tonight because what would I be doing? Reading, reading the comments. the comments, and we would not be having such an in-depth conversation. <laughs> That's part of my problem. That's like, hold on, Dave. Hold on. Stucky305 <laughs> wants to say he loves your shirt. <laughs> I do have a problem with that. So, but listen, all right? So here's the thing. I love the different perspectives that come to this show. Last right. week I was reading, and, and there was some, some people that were questioning some of the things that we're saying. And I love that they question those things. That's right. what drives the, the value of this show, I think, is that we're talking about folks that are diehard believers, diehard non-believers, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And I think with this story, somewhere in the middle of what he talked about, whether it's 18 days and 62,000 years, whatever it was, something happened to this gentleman. It was, it was 92 days and 18 minutes, dude. Come on, Dave, I've been, I've been, yeah. there's drinking. a bottle over to the left. Here is drinking. Yeah, I'm surprised we made it this far, this coherent. You know why? Uh, I didn't have a story tonight. What? No, 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 you didn't let me read a story. No, no, we still went almost an hour and a half. Uh, imagine if I allowed you to read at this point. Can, can I go back to the prior story for a moment? Sure. Because we we talk about, uh, and forgive me here, the, the lucidity of dreams, right? Right. I have read a number of stories about musicians. Everybody knows I'm a big you know, music fan. Of musicians who will have a dream about lyrics and they wake up and they immediately write down what those lyrics are. And I was talking to my daughter this weekend who loves to write music, and she was telling me that she hates when she's in a dream. She wakes up and she goes, Oh gosh, that was great. And you know how you can start to immediately lose your remembrance? Right. So right. She has let it be in her mind. And no, she can only get out two sentences of let it be because you start to forget. So when you think about this technology that they were talking about, imagine if you could capture what you actually are dreaming. McCartney's talked about this, how he keeps a, um, well, he used to keep a little pad by the side of his bed. Now it's his phone. But he said, you know, I'll dream an entire song and I'll wake up. And sometimes I remember the entire song. 
And sometimes I remember two lines. And he talked about, I, I forget which documentary it was, how he's got a, a, a notebook full of one, two, three lines that he's he's had from a dream for, from songs back in the 60s that he's never been able to finish from a dream from 50, 60 years ago. And so imagine if this technology actually works. Well, you know, here's another interesting element. One of the other uh, experiments that's being done out there is there is AI that they can connect to you. And and actually, I think I mean even it might even have to do with that chip we talked about earlier being attached to the brain, that they're getting signals from the brain. So I could think of you and oh. it would create the image of you. So the brain is that you could think a word and it'll tell the people what the word is. You could think the image and it could do. So imagine you go to sleep. Paul McCartney goes to sleep with this on. And as he's getting the lyrics to the song, it's transcribing them. Now, would you consider that a Paul McCartney song? Or because he's receiving it in the dream realm, is it something other? Is it a supernatural element? Most musicians talk about opening a channel and some of them will just start feverishly writing music and it feels like it comes from somewhere outside of them through them. They talk about it wasn't me. It just came yeah. to me. Right. I, 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 you know, we're living in such a great time right now. I yeah. wish I'd been born maybe 20 years later because I think the things that are going to happen once we pass are mm -hmm. going to be absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah. Well, so it'll be interesting. You in your 20s, right? You've got some pretty cool stuff to look forward to. Who's in your 80s? Dave, you want to explain? Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, we've talked about too in the past is the fact that some of these machines that they're working on will be able to like video capture your dreams and the things that are going on inside your head. So we may not be far removed from getting those elements of seeing, hearing be interesting to have these dream visitations when that happens does the brain perceive it as a real function or as a dream function right do the lyrics come to paul mccartney from an external force or something inside of him opening that you know the, these lyrics oh, like lenin is feeding him things right you know is that is it coming from an external force or is it coming from internally where he's it's just awakening in his mind because when I've got to believe that when you create and you're an artist and you create music and you create things, your brain is constantly putting words together and melodies and rhythms. And you're, you're constantly seeing pieces of puzzles coming together. I, I liken it to the fact that when I got a 3d camera, it made me appreciate looking at things differently. And I've shown you some of the pictures when I've been on trips yeah. is that I can look at something but if I if I shift over in a few inches and take a picture, I get a, a beautiful view of this branch in the foreground and the castle in the you know in the aft, and then the water in between, and it's a different perspective. And I'm seeing more of that image than I would normally see. And it's taught me to see 3D, which sounds peculiar, I understand, but has taught me to see things in a different perspective in life. So there are times I can really enjoy a moment. And sometimes I'll even shift over a little bit just to get a better view of it through like a temporal lens. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling like a goof, but I love this kind of stuff. So I'm excited to see where technology takes us, what happens next. And maybe someday it'll just be the four of us sitting here. Four of us meaning who? You, me, and our brains. And we'll have these things wrapped up. And then on the middle screen will be all the things we're actually thinking. No, 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 because I think other things during the show, Dave. No, 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 no. That's Did what you I imagine? have to the show. <laughs> when Greg starts talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if it. that's the case, I want to get to the point where our listeners and viewers also are hooked up to the device so we can see what they're <laughs> thinking when Dave's talk or when Greg. I don't talking. need to because I've watched some of the comments and I know many of these women are just picturing <laughs> Greg back. riding the back of a horse with a shirt off and his hair blowing in the wind. Uh, funny stuff. We've got to wrap it up here. Thanks oh. for being here with us. Thanks for spending your Wednesday night. Uh, the Colonel, Greg, Tress, uh, Tressa. Uh, we're, we're sorry you couldn't be here with us tonight, but we had fun without you. So uh, hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Hey, for, for, for Greg not to be here, 
first time ever I put a background for Greg. Oh, you did. You created a background. And then I drank for Marty. I talked to you. And I didn't even say, shut up, Dave, one time for Tressa. There you go. You got it out for Tressa. Now she's been covered. Sweet tea. All of them have been represented. And I've got a weird yellow hue to me tonight. So I'm kind of channeling early Marty on this program. (laughs) The good old days. (laughs) And your background's purple like Greg's face. It's amazing. It all comes together right here on the Paranormal 60 News. Alexa, order multiple copies of the brand new book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness by Dave Schrader. 